Good morning. How's everybody doing today? It's such a blessing to be here again with the Utica Church of Christ, as well as with my family. And then, just know we as, as many of you know, I'm with the Highland Church of Christ, and we are definitely keeping my family, Brian, in prayer, as well as the congregation of Utica Church of Christ. I just want to thank Brian and all the leadership um, that's in charge that allow me to be able to be here to, to bring forth the word. I do not take it for granted, although there are times I get nervous about God's word because it is so important. And I never want to think that I have it all together. But I pray that he will always use me in a mighty way to bless someone in their journey. So with that being said, I'm going to ask that you turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47. And while you're turning there, I definitely want to give honor to my wife who is here with me today. Uh, I don't know where I would be without her. I couldn't be the man today without her. Uh, I got through a lot of yelling from her, but it's still all good. She kept, all that yelling was needed because it wasn't her yelling at me, it was God yelling at me through her to keep myself together. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47. And it reads, then they, gladly, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. And every man had need and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, God loves it when we in, imitate his character by displaying integrity, honesty, and purity of heart. When we obey God, it shows him that we love him enough to trust him with our life. Contrary to popular belief or contrary to popular opinions, true love is first a courageous commitment and our unwavering choice to care for one another. Their love in turn produces powerful feelings. When we practice the qualities and behaviors described in these verses, the Bible promises that we will experience satisfaction and fulfillment. It's easy to like people who are likable, but we model God's love more than we show love to those who are difficult. Sacrifice is a waste of time and treasure without love. Love energizes Christians to become soul winners. Compare our passion for souls to that of Christ on the cross. Love enables Christians to love one another. A loving church has a powerful impact on the community. Love empowers pastors and preachers to love their people. God empowers his servants to love the unlovely. The question we all should ask ourselves is, how should we show our love to God? One of the things we must avoid doing is wasting our love and squander to insignificant people that's trying to stop our progress in our spiritual walk. That means you have to have a willingness to worship. 
Because glory belongs to God and not ourselves. That means we have to have a mindset to worship daily, not just Sunday or even Wednesday. Romans chapter 12 says we have to be a living sacrifice, which means we have to be daily in devotion with God. So there should no longer be just Sunday worship only. During the week, you should be able to give God some type of devotion, whether it's prayer, reading your Bible, or some type of Bible class. And when you have a willingness to worship, then now you are in a position to avoid Satan. Because Satan wants to contaminate your faith and the faith of those who are around you. And the reason he wants to contaminate your faith is because he wants us to have the same destination that he has, which is not to go to heaven. But I don't know about you, brothers and sisters. I do plan to go to heaven. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but as long as I continue to obey his word, I do plan to be singing and rejoicing at his throne. And when you are able to avoid Satan, now you are in a position where God can plant a seed of greatness in your inside of you. Because his purpose has to be fulfilled in your life. Notice I said his purpose and not your plan. Because if your plan is fulfilled in your life rather than his purpose, then you cannot be great. And when you understand that you have to have a seed of greatness planted into your heart, then now you can trust the Lord. We have to learn how to trust God that he will provide all of our needs. And when you are able to trust him, then now you can eliminate any negativity in your life. Because Satan will continuously redirect your focus on who you are in Christ. And if you continue to allow him to have negativity in your life, then now you will stop putting yourself in the position to be a mirror of the love we receive from God so that we can demonstrate it to other people. Because God wants to demonstrate the love to us, or he wants us to demonstrate the love to the people that the love he demonstrated to us while we were yet sinners. So we have to be a loving church. Let me give you an example. As a young boy in elementary, I had to be about second grade, eight years old, seven years old. I never forget, my parents sent me to Alabama to go to school where my grandmother lived. And while I remember, to make a long story short, while I was in school, I never forget, I was running in class. And I don't know if I tripped on the carpet or somebody tripped me, but as I was falling, I saw a pencil on the floor. When I fell, I didn't see that pencil no more. The pencil had ins inserted in my leg, just below my knee. But I, I noticed it right when I tried to get up and walk. So if it, it, I had to, my grandmother had to take me to the hospital. When the hospital discharged me, I don't know if my parents didn't have insurance or anything because my grandmother had to be my physical therapist. She had to take my leg out of the cast and bend it and straighten it. Why you say that, Brother Sims? Because she knew that if she did not bend it and straighten, I couldn't walk right. See, some of you all make decisions in your life that now God has to have physical therapy spiritually in you. And because he is trying to work things out so that you can walk right again, it feels like pain. But the one thing that made the difference was, as long as my grandmother's hands was on me, it had me to have a different perspective of her love because I recognized she loved me enough to not want me to walk cricket. God loves you enough that he doesn't want you to walk cricket. So even when he's trying to straighten out things in your life, you're going to experience some pain, but that's when you need to focus on his love. And when he shares that love with you, now he didn't give that love for you to be lovable. He gave that love to you so you can share it to somebody else. See, what we have to understand is being deeply loved by others gives us strength. While loving others deeply gives us courage. The title of my lesson is The Power of a Loving Church. The Power of of a loving church. Bow with me as we approach the throne of grace together. Oh, gracious heavenly Lord, Father, we approach your throne of grace, thanking you for this wonderful, glorious opportunity. We ask that you will continue to be with us, continue to guide us, continue to love us, oh, Father. We know the difficulties that many of us are here are experiencing at this time, but we ask that you'll put your hands on us, oh, Father. 
Let us know that your presence is with us and there will be times that you are walking with us and times you are carrying us, oh Father. But allow us not to re remove or to lose that trust that we have in you, oh Father. Continue to keep us confident in your glorious son, Jesus Christ. Allow us to be in a position and allow you to be good to us, oh Father, whereby we will not give up on this journey, on this walk, by, whereby we will have a selective hearing, but we will continue to be a pleaser of you rather than a pleaser of man. So to continue to be with us, continue to guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three points I want to make the, for the, in this lesson to be yours, brothers and sisters. Three points. The first point is they love the Lord. They love the Lord. And we're talking about the people in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. They love one another. They love one another. They love lost people. They love lost people. First point, they love the Lord. They love one another. And they love lost people. It says, they that gladly received his word were baptized. They responded to God's message of love. The gospel. The evidence of their love for God was through baptism. Communion and baptism shows God's love. Communion speaks of Christ's death. Baptism speaks of the burial and the resurrection. Baptism shows our love for Christ. Baptism is following Jesus. Baptism is obeying Jesus. Baptism is identifying with Jesus. How are you showing your loyalty to God? Jesus is our Lord who shall always have first place in our hearts. So therefore, when God has first place in your heart, then now you have a mindset to be committed to your life purpose. Because God is always setting us up so that we can, so that he can get us to fulfill our destiny. And when you recognize that you have to be committed to life purpose, then now you know that the old man has to be removed. Because our troubled days should one day become our triumphant days as long as we learn to trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I say trust in his name, I mean name in the Greek means authority. So when you say in Jesus' name, amen, you're saying in Jesus' authority. So you have to trust in his authority. That means the old man has to be removed. And when the old man is removed, now you're in a position to receive God's goodness. God's goodness can only be received because of his righteousness not our righteousness. God declares us righteous. You can never be righteous enough to receive his goodness. So because he's righteous always, that's when he gives us his goodness. And then when you receive his goodness, now you can receive divine relief. You can only recognize divine relief when you rest in the knowledge that Jesus bears our burden. Let me give an example of him bearing our burdens. Turn with me quickly. Turn with me quickly to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of Daniel chapter 6, what I want to go to, but I pray that you will read it at your leisure. And what you will read is Daniel chapter 6, verse 4 to 10. Daniel chapter 6, verse 4 to 10. So I'm just going to pull out a couple of scriptures, and then I'm going to make a couple of points. But when I want, again, I want you to go home and read Daniel chapter 6, verse 4 to 10. If you're there, say amen. Amen. All right, look at verse 4. Verse 4, it says, Then the president and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. Here it is. The scripture here is showing us how different Daniel is. The question you have to ask yourself, why was Daniel so different? Because he loved the Lord. 
And because he loved the Lord so much, when you go home and read the scripture, you'll find out that he was being elevated because of the love of the Lord. And while he was being elevated, there was people around him that didn't like his elevation. So now they said they had to find a way to make Daniel look bad. And they couldn't find nothing. So what they did was they went to the king and they made a creed in order to get Daniel in trouble. They said, we're going to make a law where people have to pray to you and no other God. When Daniel heard that, he continued to do what he was supposed to do. So, look at verse 4 again. The presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. Repeat after me, church. People who love, the people who love the Lord may be persecuted. Amen. See, our walk will be challenged when you love the Lord. Don't think it's going to be a utopia world when you love the Lord. If the world hated Jesus, and if Jesus is inside of you, they're going to hate you too. That's why we have to have a proper relationship with the Lord. We should not have where we're trying to win a popularity contest with other people. The only popularity contest we should be winning is with Jesus. Look at verse 5. It says, except we find it against his concerning the law of his God. Here it is. Now they're going to use him praying to his God to, to go against him. I repeat after me, church. Those who love the Lord must expect problems. You're going to have some problems when you love the Lord. See, our witness is going to be challenged. People are going to test your faith. And that's why you have to have a proper view of self as well as a proper relationship with God. Look at verse 6. or I'm sorry, verse 10. It says, He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God. So here it is. Even though the king issued a creed, to not pray against any other God, Daniel still did it. And he did it three times a day. And when you read it, he didn't close his window and do it. He opened his window and still prayed. Repeat after me, church. People who love the Lord find all the help it needs in prayer. You need to have a prayer life. Our worship will be challenged. As well as you have to have a proper handling of problems. Prayer is the proper way to handle your problems. Because when you take it to God, he will take care of you. He might not do away with the problem right away, but he's going to change you while you're in the problem. So that you can become stronger to deal with it. See, what we have to understand is... No matter, we might not see God every day, but as long as we love in one another, we know God is living in us. So, that was the first point. They love the Lord. Number two, first and second point, they love one another. They love one another. Going back to Acts chapter two, it says that they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. They love to gather to hear God's word. Today, the tendency is to gather less. That's what people want to do. Nobody wants to gather as much as they did in Acts chapter 2. But we need to change that mindset. We need to love to come together. Not only come together to fellowship, but to hear his word. Also it says, they stayed steadfast, they was in fellowship. This is a great reason for gathering and worshiping. Christians should love one another. The closest bond is that we are members of his body. I would dare to say the blood, the, the blood that connects us in Jesus is a whole lot thicker than even your family's blood. Especially if they're not in the body of Christ. And then it says they were steadfast and breaking bread. Sharing communion 
and remembering Christ's death. Speaking of Christ's love at the cross. It says they were steadfast in prayer. Building love for one another. Sharing needs and rejoicing in God's provision. See, we have to ask ourselves, is God guiding you through his word? What we have to understand is the church is just a body of called out believers. So if you're a body of called out believers, then you must be led by the Holy Spirit. And if you allow yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit, then allow God to change you, but don't complain about it. Changes need to happen in your life. You can't live with the old man expecting to become a new person. So when you're being led by the Holy Spirit, then now you know that you have to only believe in the right object. Only believe in the right object. Because when you believe in the right object, you are going to run into some storm. And storm is supposed to push you to maturity. If you believe in the right object. The object is God. But if you don't believe in the right object, then what storm is going to do is going to maintain immaturity in your spiritual walk. So not only do you believe in the right object, do not look back. You have to finish this journey. And the only way you can successfully finish this journey is to continue, continue to move forward and do not look back. Anybody remember Lot's wife? She couldn't survive today if she would have continued to move forward. But when she looked back, she was destroyed. Don't destroy your spiritual walk by always looking back. Wondering, what can I go back to? So not only do you not look back, but you have to receive the Christ so that you can receive of the glory. Let me say again, you have to be in a position to receive Christ so that you can be received of the glory. I'll never forget, in my, as, a, in, as a student in middle school, I had three guys that I used to hang around with. And we were close. We were just close, close, tight knit. And we called ourselves the A team. I'm, I'm, I'm good with my A team. Everybody remember the A team? Take my 1984, whatever it was. And it was four guys. And we, but, but even though we called ourselves the A team, we didn't go around beating people up. The reason we called ourselves the A team is because we held ourselves accountable. When our grades were going down. And anytime we were falling short or our behavior in class was acting up, we came to each other and we had to build each other up and encourage each other in order to stay on track so that we can get through middle school. But yet, we graduated from middle school, we separated with different high schools, and then I picked up another, another group, which was my youth group, as a major of Christ for my son. We had the same kind of fire. We encouraged one another, we built one another up, we loved one another. But when I went off to college, I, I still yet to experience that type of love. Because when something happens when we become adults, we become distant. We don't have the same desire to really want a fellowship with one another. But that's when we get closer to Christ, we have to change our mindset. That's why our mind has to be renewed every day. The more we come in contact with Christ, the more we want to love each other. Because what we have to understand is we cost too much for God to forget about us. The price he paid for us was high. And he doesn't want to forget about us. So number one, we, they love the Lord. Number two, they love one another. And then the third point and the lesson to be yours is that they love lost people. They were constantly witnessing and praising God. The Lord added to the church daily. We are all to be involved in outreach. I said it this morning in Sunday school. We can't expect leadership to evangelize to our visitors that we bring to church. The teaching has to start because you have the relationship with the person. So the teaching starts with you and them, and then when, they, when you invite them to church, it just confirms what you've been teaching them. We are the whole church, and the whole church is to be a team to reach out to the world. 
is the power of love active among this congregation? We, because how we determine, how we show love outside in the world shows us how much we practice the love in the church. And the Bible says that they know you are his disciples by the love you show. And you have to have enough love for people that I want to win them to Christ. I have the mindset, I want to take as many people to heaven as possible. And so when I encounter them, and especially family members, my goal is to try to teach them. Now, I'm not saying be overbearing and beating them over here with the word of God, but focus on people who have a desire to want to change in their life. Let me give you a scripture example, and then the lesson will be yours. Turn to me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And once again, I'm not going to read this whole scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 12, but at your leisure, read it from verse 1 to 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 to 12. And notice this is a gracious invitation to repentance. So let me give you a summary if you're not familiar with this chapter. Here it is. If you know about chapter 11, you know David made a mistake. He made an error. He slept with Bathsheba. Uh, Bathsheba. Be you know what her name is. <laughs> Okay, so now here it is. God sends Nathan to talk to Daniel. Because now, I'm sorry, he sends Nathan to talk to David. Because now David has made this error. Not only did he sleep with Bathsheba, but he had her husband killed. And now he is, he going about his business. So look at verse 4. Nathan tells Daniel, he's telling him a story about a man who took his sheep. And in verse 4 he says, but took the poor man's lamb. So what he is, he's telling David a story and saying, let me tell you the story about this man who stole this other man's lamb. And David has the mindset, oh, that man should be punished. Repeat after me, church. Exposing error with grace. I'm using this example to show you that there are going to be some people in the world that's like David. They're going to consistently make errors in their life. But God's going to use you like he's using Nathan, Nathan to expose the truth with, to them. But you have to expose their error with grace. How are they going receive to receive the word if you don't have grace in your heart? See, that's why we have to be in the spirit of love when we're teaching somebody else. And we have to set ourselves up where we would almost never be discordant. Never get into an argument with people. Just show them what the word says. And then move, move on for there. Look at verse 6. He says, and he, he shall restore the last foretold. David is saying, this is what should happen to the man that stole it. He shall restore it. Repeat after me, church. Examining his potential pardon. You, when you teach somebody the truth and you teach them with grace, now people are examining their potential pardon. Pardon just means forgiveness. Now you're exposing that they're in darkness, and now they are examining themselves, saying, maybe I need to come out of darkness. Which means now they're reaching, they're in the process of spiritually reaching to God's hand so that he can pull them out. But God using you as the vessel of honor. Look at verse 7. He says, thou art the man. Now Nathan tells them, you are the one I'm talking about. Repeat after me, church, explaining truth with grace. So that means you have to be in the position that when you're teaching somebody, you're explaining the truth to them with grace. And the reason I'm emphasizing this because I was there at one time when I used to, I used to, Brian would tell, I'd go out and tell people, I was, anybody can grab, teaching the word of God. And when they didn't want to receive it, I didn't have grace in my heart. I did it with content. Well, you're going to hell then. Get away from me. How can people want to receive the truth if you don't have grace in your heart? That's why we have to have the spirit of wisdom, whereby we almost never are daunted or fearful about teaching somebody the word of God. Look at, there's a verse where it says, the sword shall never depart from thy house. This is what he tells David. This is his punishment. Repeat after me, church, exploring his punishment with grace. When you teach somebody the word of God, you're going to have to let them know what direction they going in? See, you, see how I responded when I was, didn't have grace in my heart? You go on to hell. You don't do it that way. You just show them in the word what happens if you refuse God. 
and let them see it for themselves. That's why we have to be in the spirit of faith. Almost never be discouraged. See, those who obey God's commandments are the ones who love him the most because they always obey him. That's how we show love to God, by obeying him. We must have the love, must, our love must be to the highest degree. Therefore, we must live his precepts so that somebody else can enjoy his promises. That means we have to allow God to order our steps because God will inconvenience you so that you could be in a position to help somebody else. The question is, when you get frustrated, when you become inconvenienced. God, you might be heading in the direction and God might bring somebody in front of you that you got to teach them the word. And it might not necessarily be verbally teaching them, but at least show you shining a light around their darkness. Okay? And then you got to have, understand that victory has already been given. God has already promised you the victory. So you got to have the mindset, I'm planting the seed, somebody else is going to do the watering, but God will do the increase. And then at that particular time, you can expect a blessing from God. And I pray that right now somebody will truly believe right now that somebody is going to become a part of this family. Let me give you an example and then a lesson to be yours. I was reading a story about a teacher in Portland, Maine. She took her fourth grade class to the Gulf Sea, I think it is. And she was trying to teach them about how uh, that ocean goes and then it turns into Europe. So she decided that she was going to do an uh, experiment with the students. She had purchased bottles for the students and she had them put their message and the address in the bottom. They gave it to a, a fisherman who took it out of the boat and threw it in the ocean. So now they're waiting for a response from people. A couple of months later, they got a response from two people in Canada. After that response, they didn't hear nothing else. So they thought that the bottles were just lost in the sea. Two years later, a young man got a call from another young lady that found his bottle washed up on shore in England. She contacted him. Why are you telling us this story about Sarah? Just like they put the message in the bottle, hoping that if there's somebody else, you're going to give a message to somebody who lost in the world, hoping that they're going to respond. But you have to understand, they might not respond right away. They not, might not respond in two days, they might not respond in two weeks. They might not respond in two years. They might respond in two years. But you plant the seed. The whole goal is that you have to be willing to plant the seed. Because if you plant the seed, somebody's going to do the watering, God's going to do the increase. The goal is to be successful in this. Because sometimes what happens is when you teach somebody, if they don't receive it right away, they will say, well, it didn't work. I don't want to keep doing it. You have to keep doing it. But the one thing you have to do in order to do it to be successful, you have to talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. Because when you pray about it, then you let you give it to God and say, I did my part, and you move on to the next. One of the things we have to do when we're teaching the word of God, we have to trust the Father's compassion and work. While you teaching it, he's working through you, giving you the word, and he's giving the compassion to work. That way now you can face the challenge confident. If you know that God has compassion to work on this individual, you can face it confident. You have to trust the glorious son cleansing work. If you know he's cleansing this person because he's using you with the word, then now you can face the challenge confident. Then you have to trust the Holy Spirit is his converting work. If you know that he's converting this individual, maybe not right now, but maybe later on, then now you can face the challenge compliant. What's the challenge? Because the challenge is, I don't want to teach somebody. I don't know if they're going to accept it. I don't know if I'm going to say the wrong thing. Trust the God that he's working through you. But you have to do your part by preparing. That means you've got to study. You have to be in daily devotion. One of our responsibilities, or a couple of our responsibilities, have to make God's passion known. 
We make God's passion known through us. Because we make sure our sacrifice is involved with our surrender. And as long as our sacrifice is involved in our surrender, then now we're showing people how passionate we are, how God's passionate about us. We have to make people aware of God's presence. That means your dedication has to be involved with your devotion. When you see your dedication, or when they see your dedication involved in your devotion, then now they can see God's presence. We have to make God's power known to other people. That means our patience has to transcend our tribulations and our problems. I said it earlier in Sunday school. Don't approach people with a frown face or with a frown face. Nobody's not going to see the work of God that you frown. You got to have a joyous spirit when you're talking to somebody. Because when they see you joyous, they want to be a part of that joy. Then we have to show God's plan. We have to make God's plan known to individuals. And His plan is we show them what the Word of God said. It's help them to hear the Word of God either by bringing them to church or teaching them ourselves. Then we help them to believe. Then once they believe, they repent of their sins because God's compassion work is being done by them. And then they confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Matthew chapter 10 says, you could, if you confess me before men, then I'll confess you before my Father. Then eventually at some point, they will be baptized and added the body of Christ. But we have a responsibility. One thing I want to encourage you all, or challenge you all, Utica, is the fellowship daily. Get into God's word daily. Break daily, break daily. Not just on Sunday on Wednesday. The more we get together and we do that, the more successful we are. You've heard the word. Whatever you need to do. You've already accepted Christ by all you need to do is get up, come up, and ask for forgiveness. But if you want to be a part of this family, I encourage you to come up. Give your right hand to man and your heart to God. Man. And whatever you need to do, we can do it together while we stand and as we sing.